Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live. And tonight we have with us paranormal investigator Dave Schrader. Dave, thank you so much for being our guest. In honor of you, I am wearing my ghost bait t-shirt. I like uh, it. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Uh I love talking uh to people in the paranormal field. Uh I've had the privilege to talk to quite a few, and mm -hmm. having you is just icing on the cake. So let's Thank just uh, go through some of your public highlights. Now, you've done countless documentaries. Uh, you've worked with, again, countless, numerous other paranormal investigative teams. You're the lead investigator on the Travel Channel slash Discovery, Discovery Plus, The Holzer Files. That's right. And now you have your own podcast called uh, The pa The Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. That's mm -hmm. also the name of your YouTube channel. I invite all our viewers to check it out. Again, it's The Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. You have some great guests, talk about a lot of interesting stuff. So let's start off with the podcast. Um, at quick glance, when people see the title of your podcast, they think it's 360, but it's not, it's 60. Is there any significance to the number 60, which you chose for it to be the title? Yeah, I know it's because you look at me and think I must be 60, but that's not it. It's 60 <laughs> minutes long. Okay. I, I, I've i been the host of Darkness Radio for almost 17 years. And Darkness Radio, we have been everything from a one-hour, two-hour, three-hour, 90-minute. We've kind of bounced all over depending on what station we're on or what podcast tool. I just walked away from that show in January after 16, 17 years of doing it wow. and launched the, the Paranormal 60. Because we live in a different generation, right? We're now in uh, people have TikTok minds. They want things in short bursts. So with the Paranormal 60, I'm doing shorter segments, um, you know, more guests and trying to just be a little bit more adaptable to the way people seem to be enjoying their entertainment. Absolutely. Now, everybody has a different path uh, to becoming a paranormal investigator. Mm -hmm. Usually, uh, it starts out with them having some kind of personal experience as a child, a teenager, a young adult. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your path. What led you to making this your life's work? Well, I was bit by a radioactive ghost, and I soon be... Oh, wait, no, that's the wrong story. Uh, I, <laughs> you know, people always ask me that, you know, what, what got you into ghost hunting? I think the paranormal's been hunting me my whole life. I, I had experiences when I was very little with my grandmother coming back to visit me. I lived in a haunted house in uh, Medina, Illinois. Um, I've just been in the right place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the right time on numerous occasions. So uh, I, as I look back at my life, I've, I'm kind of the Forrest Gump of the paranormal. I've been in the right place to meet tons of celebrities and, and have these amazing moments in my life. And then to be there to see a Bigfoot when I was 12, see UFOs in the sky over Trout Lake, Washington in wow. 2006, ghosts uh, having psychic phenomena happen around me. So it's I've just kind of been there in the midst of it and enjoying every minute of it. That's fascinating. Now, uh, tell people in your podcast you mm -hmm. cover a wide range of issues. I know you talk to other uh, television paranormal investigator personalities. Mm -hmm. You talk to mediums. What can people expect when they tune in to the Paranormal 60? Well, hopefully they can expect to have some fun. My, my goal has always been in doing this uh, to educate, entertain, and enlighten people. You know, with Darkness Radio, draw the name draws people in and it's, it offends some people off. They're like, oh, I don't want to be in a place of darkness. But the whole concept was all the good stuff happens at night, right? Mm -hmm. The UFOs, cryptids, ghosts. So that's what we, our main focus was. But I've always tried to make it light and entertaining and have a good conversation with the guests and, you know, have it feel like two buddies sitting down over a beer, just getting to know one another. Exactly. And that's always been my, my hopes with this program. So in each episode... I, I usually have two guests that are on for 15 to 20 minutes each. Um, we have other little segments like buy the book where I'll go over a brand new book that's been released that has paranormal themes and I talk about the book. We do upon further review where I tap one of my friends, uh, some of my celebrity paranormal friends to go watch a horror movie of my choosing or some paranormal themed movie. And then they do a, a review for us. And it's kind of looking at movies that people have maybe overlooked over the years. And that's, that's what we've been doing. And then, you know, I've got other experts that come on and answer questions. And, and then we do a news show every Friday. 
uh, where I sit down with a panel of my friends that are spread out all throughout Texas. I wish they were all over the United States, but they just live in Texas. <laughs> but, uh, but they come from every walk of life, from tech and, and business to uh, law enforcement and military careers. So we, we have these interesting dialogues about news stories that are coming out around the world regarding the supernatural. And uh, we'll talk about the stories, show if there's video or photographic evidence, uh, discuss it amongst ourselves of what we think these aspects mean. And, and again, we try to do it all light and have some fun with it. That sounds like a lot of fun. Let me ask you, uh, mm -hmm. when you're not doing it uh, on television, do you still take on uh, cases that don't involve being in front of a camera uh, mm -hmm. to help people out uh, to see to satisfy your own curiosity or there's just not enough time for that anymore? It, it depends. You know, I mean, I'm, I, I have a lot of kids. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff going on in my daily life and then, you know, doing the two podcasts a week, uh, filming the TV series and uh, Holzer files has not been picked up for a third season, but I did film a new series with the medium Cindy Kaza. Okay. And uh, so we'll be on a new program coming out this year. Um, and that's all I can say about that yet. They okay, haven't made the gotcha. formal notice on it, but uh, I, I don't get out to as many and it's a little harder now because you get people that just want you to come out to their home because you're on TV yeah. as opposed to it being legitimate paranormal. But I try to talk people through it. And if there's an issue, I will have them uh, go to a team that I know or trust, or I try to find somebody in their area that uh, I can connect them with. Absolutely. I ask this question a lot to paranormal investigators. Uh, we have seen people from, you know, way back in the 60s, 50s to now uh, getting evidence. As the technology kept improving, we have gotten more and more evidence. Do you mm -hmm. think we're at a point right now, uh, you guys have proven that there is something after death, okay? But the question, what happens as soon as you die, the, 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 the questions that people really have on the forefront of their mind about death and what exactly happens, do you think we're ever going to get answers uh, through investigations? I mean, I know that's difficult. Uh, I mean, like I said, for it's, me... It's tough to... to... Yeah. To give you a defining line to say, yes, we're going to get definitive answers. I don't think we'll ever get definitive answers. I think we will get things that keep us encouraged to keep asking questions and to keep going the extra step to learn and educate ourselves. But I don't necessarily believe that it is uh, that we're going to uncover all of the truths. Um, but listen, science has come a long way. There are major medical facilities and universities across the world that are doing tests on cyclical phenomena, uh, life after death, reincarnation, and their, their findings are astounding. Yeah. So we can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's easier to be a skeptic than it is to be a believer. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a preponderance now of evidence that shows that something happens. But what is that something? I don't know if it's truly dead people in the sense that we're thinking like I cack over and all of a sudden my ghost floats out of my body and starts haunting this house. Or are we dealing with time slip phenomena? Are we dealing with alternate or parallel universe phenomena where the things we're seeing are things that are taking place just a step to the left, right? In, gotcha. in, 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 in our perceptions. So it's impossible to say what exactly we're dealing with, but it's fun to have that work to try to research and, and, and see if we can take it to another level to maybe get a better understanding of what comes next. I have seen uh, one of the episodes on the Holzer files, you got knocked down. It was really <laughs> kind of scary to watch. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course they did the replay and you literally, I mean, if people, any skeptics out there that were watching, they were watching your legs, you were, you were literally knocked down. What mm -hmm. did that feel like? Was it just a rush of energy? Uh, because it, it scared you, obviously it would have scared mm -hmm. anybody. It knocked you down to the ground. What was that experience like? Well, you got to understand that's, uh, we were at the Whaley house in San Diego. Uh, California. It's a very famous haunted house. As a matter of fact, our, Dr. Hans Holzer really put it on the map as being one of America's most haunted houses. He and Regis Philbin went there and did some investigating and had these strange occurrences take wow. place. So it, it was deemed that. And since we were doing the Holzer files, we really, you know, we had to tackle one of the biggest cases. And 
the, the Whaley house was it. Well, that was the very first episode that as a team we got to work on. So I had never physically worked with Shane or Cindy. I knew of them and had talked to them, of course, for a few months before we got to uh, out to film together, but mm-hmm. we'd never worked in that environment. So it was all new to me. And I, you know, although I've had experiences my whole life, I've never had something profoundly touch me. I might've felt like something brushed past me and yeah. there's nothing there. You get that spider web feeling when there's no spider webs. Um, it's obvious. I never feel like something's pulling my hair. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I can, I can, <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that one. But when we were in there, we were standing under the archway, which is where they believe the original gallows were wow. and that some of these people were put to death there. And um, Violet Whaley, uh, the daughter, had taken her own life. Um, she had uh, taken a, a gun out to the outside area. I can't remember if it was the outhouse uh, or just an outhouse. Mm-hmm on the property that she went in and shot herself. Her father scooped her up in his arms, brought her into the house, laid her on the kind of couch and went to go get help. While he was gone, she expired. And I asked if the spirit that we thought we were communicating with, Juan Verdugo, might have had a hand in her taking her own life as sort of a revenge. And Viz, what was really weird is I asked that question and bang, you hear it sounds like a gunshot goes off in the house and startled the three of us, Mm -hmm. Uh, freaked out our sound guy and camera guys. And so I started playing back the recording to see if we actually captured that or was it just, we we call that DVP, which is like direct voice phenomena or direct audio phenomena. So we can hear something and we caught it and I played it back a few times. And then all of a sudden something just hit me. Shane was standing off to my right and he was this way, this far away from the wall. So something hit me i banked into shane and then i hit the floor yeah i remember yeah. and if you see that footage people are often fooled because it looks so bright but that's night vision mm-hmm. i couldn't see much around me but i half assumed that what had happened was a clumsy cameraman coming up behind me with the camera had tripped over the carpet and fell into me yeah because it was that kind of heavy weight and impact that just hit me what surprised the the directors remember this is our first episode as soon as I turn around and there's nothing there, you can see me trying to gather my wits. And and I my brain just was not having it. It was like, no, that did not just happen. So I actually went out and they wanted to check my back, make sure I'm okay. Uh, the, unbeknownst to me, the producers went over to check the footage to see if some, if I had faked it. Yeah. And, um, you know, this was their first time working with me. And mm-hmm. uh, they came back and, uh, you know, the next day when we reviewed the evidence, they go, we got to be honest with you. You know, being the first time we thought, is this guy faking something? And he goes, we can't make sense of the video footage. Your knees bow up like something hit you and pushed you up into Shane. Your knees bow up, your ankles bend, and you hit the, you just hit hard and then hit the ground. So we were all just astounded by it. And it was hard to watch again because you, your brain has a real trouble processing. I mean, you see it in horror movies, but you know that's Hollywood. Yeah. And I've, I've heard people make claims at haunted locations, but I've never, I've never fully believed in all that. I'm a skeptical believer, but this force definitely hit me. I've been knocked on my ass twice on the Holzer files. I got bit in the arm by something on the uh, uh, USS Constellation. So I'm a firm believer that they have some kind of ability and power. And again, I can't tell you if it's ghosts or aliens or the demonic or what, but I'm, it's fascinating and it is definitely freaky. And like your producers, I did the same thing. I watched the replay footage and the way your your legs buckled, it's not something that somebody can do naturally on their own to fake it. So right. that was that was really scary. Let's talk about the pioneers uh, in this field, like the mm-hmm. Hans Holzers, the the Warrens. Let's go with Hans Holzer, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I know that not, guy. Yeah, he is not as known as the the Warrens. Okay. Uh, well, he's not as known as the Warrens now. Yeah. But you have to remember that Dr. Hans Holzer, he was all the rage. He used to be on what most people in our field started with was watching shows like In Search of with Leonard Nimoy. Well, Hans Holzer was a producer and he produced many segments on that series and appeared on many segments. He had a TV show called The Ghost Hunter. Huh? He had been out there and been prevalent in the field, but you know his his star had fallen off by the time the resurgence hit in two thousand what two thousand three when Most yeah. Haunted began, then two thousand five with Dead Famous, and then two thousand five with Ghost Hunters mm-hmm. and and all these other shows. So 
he had written 145 books, was a well-loved author in this field. So it wasn't like he, you know, just wrote one or two books and vanished. He wrote a plethora of books all the way up until his death. Uh, I think his last book came out a year or two before he passed away. Yeah. Um, so, but he, he didn't get that same kind of presence. Now the Warrens really had started to fall into obscurity as well until the Conjuring movie. That's now, true. People, you know, on the East Coast were familiar with the with the Holzers because that was kind of his base of operations. And same with the Warrens. They were out in, I think, Connecticut. And yeah, that was New kind England. Of, yeah. Yeah. And that, of course, that's their, the Amityville houses were really made them famous. Right. So you've got all of these interesting things that were kind of out there. But, you know, for the rest of the world, uh, out of sight, out of mind. But, you know. Uh, the Warrens had good PR people and kept them in the the frame. And and Lorraine is a, was just a sweetheart of a woman. I was lucky enough to have her on my radio show. I think five times. Nice. Um, you know, our, the first time we spoke to her was when Ed was still alive. He was in a, uh, I believe, coma, and yeah. he was at the home. Uh, we could actually hear the beeping of the machines in the background as, as we were interviewing yeah. her. But um, Doctor Holzer certainly made an impression. As a matter of fact, Dan Aykroyd. Um, cites him as being an inspiration for his love of the paranormal. You know, Dan Aykroyd's yeah. grandfather and father were both paranormalists and researchers. Yes, it's yes. carried on, but he was a huge fan of Dr. Hans Holzer. Um, so you've got these great pioneers. You've got these people out there that were, you know, ahead of the curve. Uh, and I think what's great about working on Hans Holzer's files. Now we have the actual audio video and photographic evidence that he gathered through all of his investigations that we're able to share on these episodes mm -hmm. so that people get, uh, you know, it's kind of a time machine lesson. It's not just a reenactment. You get to hear the actual footage, yes. see the actual photographs, hear from the actual audio. It's, it's pretty remarkable. It's and creepy. then <laughs> it really right. is creepy. And then we take it the next step. Now in the 21st century here, we have things that were not available to Dr. Holzer with the different technology mm -hmm. and research capabilities. He had to go in and on microfiche or, or flipping through old newspapers, looking for articles and things to corroborate the stories he was trying to research, which was brutal. And there were times he would say, I cannot find anything to substantiate these claims. I'm not saying it's not happening, but as of this point, it's not there. He never officially closed a file. And now here we get to go in, in the 21st century, and we can find those articles more readily. We can find the survivors and, and people that had lived there and through abstract titles know who owned it, what the names were of these people. We can we can do a whole different level of investigating. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to see these, these cases that are 40, 50, 60 years old. We were able to corroborate his findings even back then and show yeah. he was on it. He didn't even understand how close to the truth he was at that time without all the capabilities we have today. I had Steve Gonzalez on the show a couple of months mm -hmm. ago, and we got into the topic of the Holzer and, and the Warrens, and he described Hans Holzer, Hans Holzer as being more of the analytical type, while the Warrens were more of the practical when it came to investigations. Having worked on Hans's files, do you agree with that? Well, Dr. Holzer was very pragmatic, and he was he was very intelligent. But he also knew his limitations so he would work with trans mediums yes. that was the tool he chose he would bring his audio recorder sometimes a video camera or film camera uh and cameras and it was more about what the trans medium was picking up on and could he corroborate that with the stories could they make sense of what was going on so he was more of the scully Right. Mm -hmm. He was more yeah. of the, the <laughs> Dana Scully from the X-Files and his medium was more of the, the Fox Mulder kind of aspect. Well, Ed and Lorraine, you know, uh, Ed was had a gift of divination or not divination. Um, yeah, well, divination. Yeah, right? so I, Ed could, would yeah. say that through the blood of Christ, that's he truly firmly right. believed that he can help people. Right. By believing so, in those words. And and he was able to pick up on things and and it's the word isn't divination that i'm looking for i can't remember the word right now it's escaping my mind but it's going into a place discernment yeah. he had the gift of discernment and he would be able to kind of ascertain what was going on there picked up on the kind of energies he had a very strong religious conviction and belief and so strong that he worked with the catholic church mm -hmm. on these cases and oftentimes when they didn't have the time 
they would send in Ed and Lorraine. And then you have Lorraine, who is very open, She's mediumistic a person, yeah. right? Sensitive. And so she was able to really tap into and harness those different qualities as well to um, prove that there was something there, at least to them. And I know there's been a lot of controversy surrounding the Warrens and, yeah. you know, with their popularity, a lot of people think, well, it must be fake. And they did, you know, no, just because just because uh, it could be doesn't mean it is. And well, also I think, think of the time they were working yeah. in back then, right. the 70s and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's the paranormal was not talked about in open unless you wanted people to think you were crazy. Right. And every every place they went, people just beat up on them. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd be on TV, people would mock them. And and it was it was brutal. But, you know, they, they stuck by their convictions all the way till the end of their lives. So. How did the the Holzer files uh, come your way uh, for you to be the lead investigator? You work uh, with uh, Hans Holzer's daughter, Alexandra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you go in with the team of uh, Cindy Kaza and Shane Pittman to do the actual investigation. Uh, it, it was It's a great setup. Uh, I loved how the show uh, replayed the tapes that Hans recorded back in the day. And you mm -hmm. guys sort of pick off pick up where he left off so how did the development of the show come along and were you a part of it uh, was it alexandra how did it all Ale come together alexandra had been working behind the scenes diligently for years and she had partnered with a production company and i think they were looking at originally pitching this as a tv series like the x-files so it would be kind of in the vein of the conjuring movies where it's yeah. based on the cases but you know it's yeah. it's acted um and there just wasn't the the same interest, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, because Hans wasn't one to jump to everything's a demon or dark. I think that that kind of turned off some networks. They want, you know, if, if they're going to put on a show, they want you to be terrified every yeah. episode. Um, but I could be wrong. Again, I'm just I'm just pontificating here about it. But uh, they said, well, what if we pitch this more as a paranormal show and we go back in and reinvestigate these cases? And then they started to cast their net and they first had Cindy Kaza, who they, you know, had been uh, connected to through the network. Mm -hmm. And um, then they reached out to me to become the lead investigator. And when they first reached out, uh, they said, we'd like to know if you'd be interested in being on a TV show as a lead investigator. I said, no, no, thanks. And really? they said, oh, uh, why not? And I said, well, I just think the, the market is flooded. There's no good original ideas out there. And I don't want to just be another ghost hunters or ghost adventures ripoff. And they go, well, let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing. We have the famous case files of a very well-known paranormal investigator, a very well-known paranormal investigator. And his daughter has given us this, and the light bulb turned on. And I go, oh, Hans Holzer? And they're like, yeah, how'd you know? And I go, well, I know Alexandra's been working diligently to mm -hmm. try to get work out there about her father, get his name as recognized as the, as the Warrens. Yeah. And um, they said, yeah. And I said, well, you know, Dr. Holzer, uh, our radio show was the last interview he ever did. And uh, I dedicated the book that I co-wrote to him. It's, you know, dedicated to, to Dr. Hans Holzer. And uh, Alexandra and I had become friends. I hired her. I think it was the first one to hire her to live events back in the day when her first book came out. And we just became friends. Um, so it was a no-brainer at that point. Yeah, we get to reopen his case file. Sure, that I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. And Cindy and I had a little chemistry test on uh, Zoom like this and had a chance to talk and get to know we, we really meshed well. So they decided to move forward with us. And then we just needed to find a good tech. And, and they brought Shane in. And Shane connected well with us. And there you go. Yeah. Uh, I think a month and a half later, we were, we were out filming. Now, uh, when it comes to Cindy, she is an amazing medium. Mm -hmm. uh, before you met Cindy, did you like to work with mediums? Uh, were you skeptical of mediums? What was your opinion? Uh, before yes, you I like to work with mediums. And yes, I'm a skeptic of mediums. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a, you got to walk that fine line. I, um, I'm, like I said, I'm a skeptical believer. I've had experiences. I've seen things that I've been able to debunk and things I cannot. I've, I've witnessed things that are beyond the, the scope of normal. So, you know, I'm open to these concepts and we would go in and, you know, I would have this thick case file of Hans Holzer's that I'd have to read through before we get there. And then I would do interview after interview with historians and, and, you know, experiencers and past homeowners. And, and then Cindy would do these walkthroughs and she would be picking up on stuff. I had no clue what she was talking about because none of it was in the case file. 
And I'm thinking, oh my God, is this girl twisting in the wind? She's, she's not getting anything, but I'd take copious notes. And then the next day I would go in and sit down with the, with the historian and, you know, I would ask a couple of the questions and then I'd go to the deeper notes, the weird or off part, you know, and be, so uh, our medium was picking up on a pink Cadillac and uh, that, oh my God, that's interesting because when the family lived here, they were Elvis fans and they had a big picture of Elvis on the wall standing in front of a pink Cadillac. And there, none of the episodes were like that, but I'm just giving you a yeah, concept. She would, yeah. it would be some obscure reference I chose out that would turn out connecting us that yes we are in the right place this is what's going on the spirit here is trying to communicate this aspect of the story so she was really powerful and i gave her a lot of credit because you know these houses and businesses and museums we were in are are 100 200 years mm -hmm. old there's been a lot of history in those places yep. a lot and of energy a lot of, absorbed everything. right a lot of lives living there and happiness and sadness and everything in between and she's got to go in there it's like taking you know war and peace book and then just without noticing flip open a page and point to the one i want you to talk about yeah she's got to try to sift through all this crap and all these other elements that are there and get to the the heart of the story and the spirits that we're trying to communicate with when you're working on a case the way you do it have the have cindy do the walkthrough first and mm -hmm. then go do the interviews the next day or the following days mm -hmm. uh to try to find corroborating evidence to what she found on her walkthrough as mm -hmm. opposed to doing it the other way around do you find that helps you uh when it comes to an investigating a case right because we don't want the medium uh hans holzer did not want his mediums front loaded with information because he didn't want them you know every good medium will tell tell you that if you tell me the information up front now i can't necessarily discern is this my imagination or is it what i'm really getting yeah. So they want as little information as possible going into the situation so they can actually draw from that evidential mediums like that. And um, we just found it was a lot more powerful. And like I said, if we had had the interviews first and then gave that information to Cindy, she might be so hyper focused on, uh, you know, these points that she would miss the you know, or, or second guess the weirder things that she's yeah. getting that might have helped us tie these these cases up really nicely. So, um, yeah, she was she was great. I think it's a great way to do it. And it certainly helped us. And when she'd say something like on that Whaley House episode, she's like, this this spirit is mad. He doesn't want us here. He's going to start messing with our cameras. And then cameras started mm -hmm. going off independently. And uh, we had a light bulb blow out outside over the headquarters area wow. we had a lot of strange activity taking place and she was picking up on it and if you remember like you know a few minutes it's probably about 20 minutes beforehand in the actual episode but if they you know the way they edit it, it's only a few minutes before i get knocked on my butt and you know she said i you know i think he's going to try to take your take out your knees and uh you know again i'm like oh, yeah sure he is okay yeah but, but and then when i got hit it, that's why my brain just kind of froze up i'm like I turn around expecting to see a cameraman. There's nobody there. I'm now hearing Cindy's words replay in my head. And I was just like, uh, too much. I got to go outside. Yeah. I, and just think about it. You were there investigating the paranormal. Mm -hmm. uh, think of the families that live in a house similar to that, that start having these experiences, not expecting anything paranormal to happen. All of right. a sudden, they're knocked, knocked on their butts. And yeah. I mean, you were there with the sole purpose of investigating the paranormal and it shocked, surprised, scared you. So just putting our, you know, putting ourselves in the shoes of the people that are experienced this right. and how scary that must be. Now, you know, paranormal investigations, a lot of people are doing them now. A lot of mm -hmm. amateur investigators. There is really no school to learn how to investigate the paranormal. It's basically, if you're lucky, latch on to somebody who has some experience, go along, learn for yourself, and then pick up the torch from there. What are your feelings in regard to how many people are doing this nowadays? And is it ultimately beneficial or hurtful to the research that is being done? That's, that's a tough... Uh tough nut to crack. Um, obviously, it's great because I, I love to see people out there and engaged in the world instead of sitting at home on their cell phones, right? Yeah. Uh, they're, they're out engaging the world, trying to find things out. Um, my worry is that most people learned everything 
from watching TV shows. Mm -hmm. And what you forget about is there's a lot that we cut out of the shows that is considered boring. Mm -hmm. And you, you forget why we do some of the things we do. And, you know, I go on investigations and people will sit there with me and we'll be in a place for two hours. Nothing happens. And then I get one EVP, you know, and they're like, oh, my God, is it always this boring? Yeah, we're in those houses for six to eight hours sometimes. And, you know, if you look at all the evidence we collected in that six to eight hours, it comes to about eight seconds of screen time. If you put it all back to back. Right. It's very fast. And it's There's all not- into a 42 minute TV show. Right. So they're taking when we're on site, we're there for five days uh, Mm -hmm. and we're filming 12 to 14 hours a day. And they've got to take all of that footage and pare it down to 42 minutes Mm -hmm. to make it uh, accessible for TV. So um, I I think it's great that there are people out there. I, I just ask them to before they join groups or do these things, ask them, what is your real want and desire here? Everybody says, oh, we want to help people. And that's not the truth. A lot of teams are out there just to get a thrill. They want to get the next piece of evidence. They want to get the next scary moment so that they can sell their story. And and before you send pissed off emails to me, folks, uh, I've I've watched it happen for 17 years, right? Where people are just looking to land that. I'm not saying all teams are like that. I'm not saying all investigators are like that, but a a majority of them are looking for their five minutes of fame. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I, oh, yeah. I, it's a I would be question. cautious going into what they do, because it, if there is something truly there and something dark or malevolent, you could piss it off. And and then the family has to stay there. You get to leave. And that family then has to deal with the torment or the mental anguish of these paranormal teams that will go in and they'll capture a <sighs> on a recording. They're like, oh, did you hear that? That's a demonic growl. We're out of here. You've got demons. And so they're an hour into an investigation and they leave telling the family they have demons. They didn't help them. They didn't know what to do for it. And then other people have to pick up the mess. And that's what, that's what worries me about this. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. I would rather they go do events. Like, um, like I I host events at the Palmer house hotel in Sauk center, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a place I know and trust go. If you want to get the thrill, if you want to have the excitement, go with somebody like us to go to these places and do this, but don't, you don't have to do it and put yourself in, in the way of um, actual clients who need help. Exactly. Uh, I I, I just 100% agree. I 100% yeah. agree. Now, you said you initially declined the show before you found out it was a mm-hmm. Holzer Files. Mm-hmm. Uh, what effect do you think having television crews in there with you doing an investigation uh, to bring it into people's living rooms to educate? There is a there is a benefit. You are educating, mm-hmm. but it is also entertainment as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to the entities like you said they could be other dimensional they could be spirits we don't know Mm -hmm. uh do you think that's a hindrance having all those people the crews the lights the cameras to where when you guys come in fully loaded like that you are not going to get the same kind of evidence if it's just a group of two or three of you or will it right we've all been in locations where our our equipment powers down yeah. because they're leaching off the energy reportedly, or the, the vortex there is pulling that energy from your equipment. Well, if you've got these guys with big battery packs on their cameras and, and they've got this inquisitive nature and they want to see something and you've got the intent set of everybody there hoping to see something. I think intent is very powerful in what we do with mm-hmm. investigations. So I think it helps because obviously they want something to happen because that's going to just make our show even better. Mm-hmm. So they're all focused on the positive. Please, please let me see a ghost. This is going to, I know they're terrified of it. And, and it's great to, you know, see the moments like Toth, our camera guy, be standing there with the camera on, you know, on his shoulder looking out. And all of a sudden behind him, we'd start hearing doom. Doom, yeah. doom footsteps and there's nobody there and his eyes are big and he'd go there's nobody there is there and i'm like no <laughs> so the the sound guys the the attacks the uh camera guys they become a part of the show and that's what i liked about holzer files we could interact with our cameramen uh and sound people and we're like did, did you hear that am i what are you here and they're like yeah yeah something's moving or i just saw something move behind you and that that helps us as investigators because we can't be in all places at once and we're in, we're looking here they're looking through another scale mm-hmm. and seeing a different aspect so it's it's it can be helpful could it be a hindrance sure um you know, but I think maybe the ghosts are there and they're wondering, what are these people doing here? What is all this stuff they've got? You know, and they might just be watching um, 
to see what we're going to do. It could go either way. If there are, mm -hmm. if they are spirits, they want to maybe be on camera. Or if they're shy, they might just stay completely away from you. It, you don't know. Um, and remember, we, we're not all in one area the whole time. We split up. Mm -hmm. So there'll be Shane in the basement with just one of the X cameras, you know, on the wall and whatever he's holding. And so then it's just Shane by himself. Mm -hmm. Then you've got Cindy in one room with her camera guy. I'm in another room with my camera guy. So at any given time, really, there's only one or two of us in a room. So we're spread out. We're able to cover more ground. If spirits want to just talk to, you know, just Shane or just a person that's alone mm -hmm. or make communication, they can, or they can make communication with me or the medium. So it really kind of, I think it works out well for the, the spirits and us. Yeah. Uh, the thing we have to watch is that thin line of not turning it into a circus, you yeah. know, of here, jump through this fiery hoop. Okay. Now jump through this fiery hoop and, you know, okay, now make this move. And, and, you know, so it's, it's trying to figure out how to make it compelling entertainment for tv but also showing respect to the entities and spirits and energies that reside there absolutely you have a lot of uh credits uh helping out with uh other shows mm -hmm. the ghost adventures you mentioned them mm -hmm. i believe you you got a, a special thanks for uh zach's uh documentary demon house right now demon house that's interesting uh a very good documentary also made a lot of money uh what was your involvement in regards to demon house you know i've been friends with zach and the guys from ghost adventures from the beginning of their first documentary and we just stayed friends and when that news story broke about that family in indiana you know zach was just stymied and he's like i want to do something on this and uh he goes I, how do we find the owner what well one producer had already kind of reached out and started locking down everybody's life story and contracting him. But I found, you know, uh, Father Magino mm -hmm. and talked to him and connected him with Zach. And I had Father Magino on my radio show. And then I found the owner of the house and put him together with Zach and Zach purchased the house. So, yeah. you know, uh, it was my work behind the scenes, helping him acquire some of these things that garnered the thanks at the beginning of the, the documentary. That's awesome. Zach bought the house and it's worthy to know he tore it down. <laughs> mm -hmm. right he yeah he down. said he didn't want anybody else sneaking no. in there or getting hurt or doing stupid stuff in the basement yeah tore it down and it's left the house or the the uh, abandoned field there he still owns the property yeah. i believe yeah, yeah um but you know now there's nothing for people to really go get involved in or hurt or open more portals he did the responsible thing you know right in doing that <laughs> now and at this stage in your career uh, moving forward, are you looking more to help other people, other investigators, maybe teach, mentor? Uh, you said you are starting a new show, so you're still going to continue doing investigations. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to focus more of your attention on? You know, that's hard to say. I'm, I'm very thankful for the TV shows and for the opportunities I've been given. Um, I really love doing my, my podcast and my radio show, mm -hmm. uh, element of it. You know, I wanted to do radio since I was a kid and I was fascinated with the supernatural since I was a kid. So to be able to marry them into darkness radio and now relaunching, rebranding with the paranormal 60, I, you know, I can do this until I pass away till they pry the microphone from my cold dead hands. Right. <laughs> so this is kind of what I'd like is for this to be, you know, the shows and, and other work and, and live appearances to be kind of a um a, just a support to the to the radio show the paranormal 60 and we do new episodes every monday and friday um and we're on most of the major podcast deals mm -hmm. from apple music and itunes to uh spotify, amazon music audible yeah. spotify podcast uh what is it podcast fanatic and uh pod chaser and all of those so you can go find the paranormal 60 there uh, we also do a video version of the show that's on my YouTube channel, and mm -hmm. uh, you can you can check that out as well. So, you know, that's where I would like it to eventually be. But while I'm getting the opportunity, you know, because I went 40 some years without ever having left the country. And uh, this this job and this work has afforded me the opportunity to, uh, you know, see Canada and uh, and then Romania, Germany, and Prague, Scotland, Ireland, France, England, Australia, um, and 
I just, I, I'm excited about that. As a yeah. matter of fact, I will mention if, if it's okay with you, yeah. I do have a trip coming up to Ireland. We're going to be doing a paranormal trip and tour in Ireland in June. We've been sold out on that one and our um, October. Uh, yes, I believe it's October, our, our October event. Um, but we just opened up six more seats on the June event. So if people are interested in going to Ireland and investigating, where can they can get, get all the information. information? Yeah, just go to darkness events dot com that's darkness events dot com or go to uh, email me dave at paranormal six zero dot com that's paranormal sixty dot com uh, so dave at paranormal sixty dot com and i can send you the links and get you the information but there's only six we're keeping it i think it's under 40 people that are going to be on on this trip um and it's going to be great we've got access to castles and hotels and crypts and all kinds of great places that we'll get to go hear the rich history see the beauty of ireland and get a chance to do some paranormal investigating as well that sounds amazing yeah. uh, just uh before we go like mm -hmm. cindy shane all the people that you've met along the way would mm -hmm. you say you've made lifelong great friends uh in this field i've you know i take it beyond that because the people that i've really connected with um have become more like relatives mm -hmm. you know like blood family, relatives yeah. to me family and uh that's powerful but yeah I've, I've made some friends and i think what really pleases me in my life is having you know darkness radio and darkness events we were the first real organization doing these big paranormal conferences when we started them in 2006 and ran them through to 2012. uh we were the first ones out there and I still get emails from people that say those were the best events I've ever been to. You know, I met my best friend there. You know, I met my wife there. I met my husband there. We now have three children. Uh, and, and to know that in some way I was instrumental in connecting people that had never found each other before yeah. and, and put them into this world to be connected. I, I mean, I'm not patting myself on the back, no, but I just no. love that sense of uh, how, how the things that we do in life affect the rest of the world around us. So I'm glad that I've been able to bring positivity and happiness and entertainment and light and life to people so that they find others that are like-minded and can live in that same spectrum and, and find love and friendship. And that's, that to me is very rewarding as I watch on, on social media every day, people share their memories of, Oh, look, this is 2009 when I met my best friend, Nicole at Eastern state penitentiary at one of darkness Dave's events. And, <laughs> they're still friends today and everything. It's just, that's so beautiful. It is. That, you know, it brings this together. And the one thing I love about the paranormal above all is it doesn't, it is not defined by a religion or a sexuality mm -hmm. or a race. Everybody's into it. And when we're there, you know, we may be on democratic or independent or Republican, but nobody talks about that. All they want to talk about is the paranormal. And they want to talk about their experiences or what experiences they hope to have. It transcends the normalcy of the rest of the world and becomes, I think, a much healthier deal. So that is one thing I will promise you. If people tune into my program, I do my very best to avoid stories that you'll hear on regular news. We're not going to talk about the war. We're not going to talk about COVID. We're not going to talk about things that you're going to get inundated with everywhere else. Unless, of course, like the one story that came out of the Ukraine where they claimed that a UFO blew up some tanks and then took off that's something i'll chat about right because yeah. that's a could this have really happened yeah. and if not what was it that's still pretty amazing so um you know if there's stories that kind of cross those barriers we'll look into them but i want it to be an escape when people come like like with you people tune in to escape and escape get entertainment world exactly and and hear from people that are fascinating from all around the world all walks of life and yep. you get to you get to talk to some great celebrities. And, you know, I, I got to do the Walker Stalker final cruise and talking to some of the celebrities that have had paranormal experiences. And, you know, it's just it's great how it, it it's the common denominator and it levels the playing field because, you know, Norman Reedus isn't just Norman Reedus from The Walking Dead. When you start talking to him about ghosts, he's a guy standing at the bar having a drink with you talking about ghosts. Exactly. And it, 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 it evens out the playing field for everybody. Do you think, there was a study done several years ago that over 60% of this world's population now believes in some sort of afterlife. That was, this mm -hmm. was done many, many years ago. Do you attribute that to a, a, at least some of it to, to the work that people, that you and other investigators have done to bring enlightenment education to people about what could possibly be there? I hope so to a degree. Um, 
I think we certainly keep the wheel in motion. So it keeps people, I, I hope people are educating themselves and looking into it deeper than just what they see on TV. Yeah. But, you know, I also think that we're in a, in a new awakening in the world, right? After 2000, uh, 9 11, you know, 2001, 9 11, uh, a lot of people started to seek answers outside of the normal and, and looking for people that can help them understand what's going on. So yeah. I think that that outed a lot of people where it used to be hushed tones of this, man, you are not going to believe what happened to me the other day. Now we can yeah. talk about it in full volume at the water cooler exactly. and somebody will pop their head up and go, God, I watched that episode too. That was so crazy. And nobody looks at you like you've got three heads. They're all, you know, it's they, they've all got anymore. something. It's not right, which is anymore. great. Yeah, it you know, great. it was no longer taboo when Animal Planet had a paranormal TV show, right? <laughs> no, yeah, I, yeah, that, <laughs> absolutely. Dave, I want to thank you so much. This has been a fascinating chat. Uh, you're doing great work. Like I told you. you before we went live, um, I really respect your investigative techniques. Uh, <laughs> you go in there with an open, honest heart. And it was good to learn that you are a little bit skeptical and you just go in there with an open mind and just whatever happens, happens. And I think that's right. that's a great way to approach this. Thank you so much. Are there any final thoughts you wanna share before we go? You know, here's the one thing I like to tell everybody. You're fascinated with the paranormal and worried about what happens next. If you lead a life that's good, and a life that's full of charity of your heart and love, and you're good to the people in your life and to the people that you're coming to contact with every day, you don't have to worry about what comes next. I promise it's gonna be beautiful. Okay. And you don't need mediums to connect you with those people that have passed over if you say everything you need to say in life. So just make the best of every day. And I know that sounds cliche, but it is the honest to God truth. And it's damn good advice too. Thank you so much to Dave Thank Schrader. Thank you to our viewers who are tuning in live and those of you who will watch this later on. This has been a great chat. Till next time, on behalf of Dave and myself, guys, stay safe and stay walking. Good night.